Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Community Conversations to both our live audience, yay, and our Zoom audience. We are figuring out all the tech to make this work so that we can make this accessible as possible. Keep in mind, we also post recordings on the LCC YouTube channel. So if you go in a few days to our website, which is lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations, you'll find the links for any future events that we have, as well as the links of previous videos that we have recorded. So if you missed, I don't know, my session a couple of weeks ago, you can go back and watch that. It was awesome. It's, I mean, yeah, I'm great. Okay. Anyway, next week, we also have um, another awesome one coming up. We have Anita Quirk, who's going to talk to us about guardianship and estate planning. So she teaches pre-law classes here at LCC, and she's going to walk us through some of the aspects of uh, both the legal and the uh, uh, financial sides of guardianship and estate planning. But this week, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Allison McCready. Allison McCready has been an adjunct faculty member here at LCC since 2005 in a variety of roles most recently working in the CEO program and teaching college success. She completed her master's in international community development in 2017 and has a special interest in how we can empower every member of our community to access social and economic capital and decision-making processes. She has three adult daughters who are all married, living independently and off her health insurance and three grandsons. Please welcome Allison McCready. Thank you, Courtney. And it's just really fun to be here. Um, so uh, when this theme of through the ages or ages and stages or life across the lifespan came across our email, I was so excited because I thought this is a great opportunity for me to talk about two things I'm super passionate about. One is community development and the other is Hopefully this is going to work. Um, community development. And then the other thing is my family. Um, this is the last time we were all able to be together, which was two years ago. Um, and since then, we've added another son-in-law and another grandson and have another baby on the way. So we are just growing exponentially. Um, I want to just clarify um, who I'm not. So I'm not a trained psychologist or family therapist. Um, what I'm sharing today is simply uh, the story of one family that has transitioned from two parents raising three small children um, to now a family of eight adults and how we have tried to navigate this transition and create a healthy and happy family culture. Uh, so I know that there are a lot of families that aren't as privileged as ours that have, um, you know, adult children who are really struggling with all of those things that make life really hard, mental illness, substance abuse, um, housing, job, loss, single parenting. Um, and so I know that um, it's hard and my heart goes out to those parents and grandparents that are in those situations. And so I do recommend counseling and family therapy um, if your situation is particularly painful. So um, again, just sharing a few ideas about what I've learned from combining these two passions of community development and parenting. Uh, I chose this title, 25 Going on Five, um, because I was thinking about, so my five-year-old grandson just learned how to ride his bike. And you know he's like, I can do it, I can do it by myself. But then as soon as he falls down and skins his knee, what does he do? He runs to someone and you know, needs a kiss on his hour. Um, and my adult children remind me of that. <laughs> so, you know, they, they want to be independent, they can do it, they can do it. Um, but then there comes that time when they still need to come back and 
get a little kiss on their, their boo-boos. Um, parenting at all stages requires patience and wisdom and grace. Um, but it, above all, I think requires a vision uh, for what we know our children can become as they move further and further into independence. Um, so how does that relate to community development? Um, what is community development anyway? If you go down the street here there, to the city hall, there's an office of community development. But what they do there is engineer sidewalks and roads and sewers and things like that. Um, my research and work is in community development in the sense of anything that helps every member of a community or a family um, to access social and economic resources, participate in decision-making processes, uh, <laughs> for their own benefit and the benefit of the community as a whole. Um, so think about what the work in a community of nonprofits, some government agencies, libraries, churches, schools, that's what I mean when I talk about community development. And there are some things about the field of community development that I think are especially applicable to um, parenting our adult children. So the first one is something called, sorry, the clicker's not working. Um, working to identify felt needs. And we're gonna define these terms as I go along. Um, felt needs, identifying felt needs and then assisting when appropriate. Second one is working towards integration, not assimilation. And finally, developing a culture of something called co-powerment. Uh, you may have heard the term empowerment. Um, this is kind of a new term that's making its way into the, the field uh, co-powerment. And again, we'll talk about what those terms all mean as we go along. So felt needs. I want to tell you a little story about a company called Tom's and what they got wrong and what they got right. So have you guys ever heard of Tom's? Okay, good. Uh, so Tom's was developed back in, I think, 2006 by a young man who was in Argentina and he was visiting an impoverished community and noticed that uh, many of the children were barefoot. And he came back to the US and he created this business model um, based on the principle of buy one, give one, where you buy the product and then the company donates um, a pair of shoes to some, someone in a poor country. Uh, so it was a really great you know, altruistic idea. And it has since then been imitated by a lot of other companies um, that have taken that model and, and run with it. Uh, the problem with Tom's is, now I'm shouting. <laughs> the problem with Tom's uh, is that the follow-up research showed that the children did not actually benefit so yes, they got a pair of shoes, but they weren't necessarily um, going to school any more than they had been. They weren't healthier, they weren't happier, they were still in poverty. And actually it was a detrimental effect because the local shoemakers and shoe sellers couldn't compete. You know, no matter how much you discount your your product, you can't compete with free, right? And so the community as a whole suffered <laughs> um, out of, as a result of this, of this initiative. Uh, now to Tom's credit, they went back to the drawing board and redesigned their business model um, 
And so now they are doing a profit sharing where they are actually giving um, local entrepreneurs grants and startup funds to start businesses within the local communities. So, um, so I wanna make sure they get credit for that. So what does this have to do with adult children? Well, this idea of felt needs, um, which we can define that as changes that are deemed necessary by people to correct the deficiencies they themselves perceive in their lives and community. So in the case of Tom's, you know, he went into the community, he saw something, he interpreted it a certain way, and then he went home and created a solution. Now, those of you that are parents know how tempting this is. <laughs> when we see our children in a situation, we know how to fix it, right? And we're gonna parachute into their lives and solve their problems. Um, without taking into account their actual spelt needs that they themselves have identified. Um, so there are times when our adult children need us, um, but we need to be really careful we don't make that mistake of Tom's. So what might be some of the felt needs of our children? Um, there's the practical, and I need to be able to play this video. Uh, okay, so those practical needs. Um, and those of you that have adult children or, you know, you know, this is true, it's true. Um, and, you know, this is where we shine, right? When they call us and they have a problem and we know how to fix it because we've lived it. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's the, when it, when it's fun, although, you know, trying to talk them through a complicated thing, like changing a tire can be tricky when you're living in different States. Hello. Hello. So, um, so the practical needs obviously, uh, are something that parents can help with. Uh, just emotional transition, stress, isolation, as our kids, you know, go off to college or move or uh, my three are scattered all over. I have one living in Germany, one in Texas, and one in Yakima. Uh, so lots of transitions for them. Uh, the relational needs, uh, relational stresses. Uh, talking through roommates, dating, marriage, parenting. Um, it's, it's all potentially areas where our kids need our help. Um, and then sometimes, well, the financial. And I was, I had like about six more slides about these particular issues, but in the interest of time, I can't go down those rabbit holes. Uh, but obviously college, getting um, into a home or even just renting, um, health insurance, health care. These are huge um, areas of need that, um, you know, this generation of young adults is uh, really facing some big, big challenges. So finally, Sometimes it's really simple. Uh, when my, I remember a time when my younger or middle daughter had gone off to college. She was living in the dorm up in Bellingham. And I had, you know, done the mom thing. I'd made her cookies. I'd brought her winter coat. I'd, I think it was Halloween. I brought Halloween decorations. I was like, just, fixing all these, filling all these needs that she didn't necessarily have. Uh, we got out of the car and I was telling her, oh, honey, it's so good to see you. We're gonna take you out for dinner. And she stopped me and she said, mom, what I really need right now is just a dad hug. And she walked over to my husband and just wrapped her arms around him. And 
it was like, oh, okay, well, that was easy. <laughs> And it was so that was about 10 years ago. And we still use this as, you know, we talk about dad hugs. And sometimes one of them will call and say, I just need a dad hug today. And, and they just need that little bit of support and knowing that we're there. And it's, you know, that's their felt need. So um, hang on. Don't want to skip anything. OK. So what I have kind of discovered is that meeting the felt needs of my adult children is kind of like having them in an elliptical orbit. And as they get older and more independent and more established with their own families, that orbit gets farther and farther. But when they're at the, you know, when, there have been times when one or more of them have been at the complete other end of the universe, right? I feel disconnected. I feel uh, irrelevant. I feel obsolete. And I start, you know, reevaluating all my life choices. And then sure enough, you know, it's not long before they come back around and they make that phone call. They need to, you know, talk to me um, in a way, you know, they need something that only I can provide and that orbit comes close again. So um, this is when it's challenging because this is when like Tom's, you know, we wanna kind of force ourselves into their lives to solve their problems or to um, be engaged. Uh, but the best thing to do is wait for them to call. Uh, wait for them to express that need um, and then uh, make the decision from there, you know, what we might be able to do to help. Okay, so principle number two is integration rather than assimilation. So I think we have at least one Star Trek fan in the, in the house. Um, so this is the Borg Queen. <clears throat> and she is a character from Star Trek The Next Generation uh, who is kind of this weird robot human hybrid. And she controls this army of minions through this hive mind. And her classic line is resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. And so anybody that comes into contact with her gets turn into one of these robot minions and loses their independent identity. And um, our family has added over the last 10 years, we've added three sons-in-law um, and now three grandsons who will grow up and, and become their own people. And our daughters themselves have also changed and grown and established kind of new identities as adults. And so we've learned to that we really need to have a growth mindset um, as we're relating to these new people, these new individuals coming into our family. Um, it's, it's kind of like converging streams, right? we need to keep in mind that their story began long before they, be, they met us. And sometimes we just wanna think, okay, now you're in our family and now we're gonna just, you're just gonna be in our family. And it's like the Borg, right? Um, when our oldest daughter brought home her first boyfriend, um, she was 19 first boyfriend ever, and they were very serious. And um, when I say brought home, I literally mean she brought him home from Germany and he was with us for three weeks. <laughs> so it wasn't just, you know, a couple hours for dinner. Um, and it was kind of like getting thrown into the deep end of the pool on the deck of the Titanic. It was really intense for our family. Uh, you know, just a lot of um, 
adjustments and you know he he didn't necessarily get our jokes and we didn't necessarily understand everything he said and um, different expectations. So he'd been there a few days and I, I kind of pulled my daughter aside and I said, so how do you think it's going? How are you feeling? And she said, well, to be honest, mom, I kind of thought when I brought Daniel home, I could just kind of sit him at the dinner table with us and he would, he would just be part of the family. And I, I didn't realize he's his own person. And so, you know, we talk about the mannequin boyfriend, like when you bring people into your family, um, whether it's, you know, serious relationships, boyfriends, girlfriends, um, you know, even roommates, um, we need to always remember that they are their own people and they have their own history, their own story, their own culture. In our case, you know, a, a completely different culture um, and their own beliefs about things. And um, our challenge is to integrate and not just assimilate them. So in our particular family, I could talk about this all day. We've had interesting conversations about time and planning. What, it, what does it mean to be late? Um, how much planning is too much planning and how much is not enough? Um, that kind of thing. Money, you know, how, how do we spend money? How do we save money? How do we give money? How do we earn money? Um, does money, you know, create conflict? Um, as they've moved into the child rearing stage, now there are different ideas about pregnancy, childbirth. Um, our oldest daughter has had two of her three at home, which freaked me out. But, um, you know, I have learned from her to be much more accepting of that um, idea. In fact, we are hosting an international student from Bangladesh, and she, I was telling her about my, my daughter's home births, and she said, everybody in Bangladesh is born at home. <laughs> like, why is that strange? And you only go to the hospital if it's an emergency. And, and so um, just really learning how to make space for those different ideas and different perspectives. Um, and then even things as simple as how do you fold your socks or how do you load your dishwasher, okay? These are all ways that we can integrate our um, new family members. Um, and sometimes their ideas are actually better, hate to admit it. Um, so I kind of uh, liken family life to bumper cars, right? When you think about um, each individual person bringing in their own kind of culture, then you think about the fact that now in our family, we have four marriages, right? So the dynamic between husbands and wives, we have parent-child relationships, we have sibling relationships, even within our kids, um, our oldest son-in-law is 10 years older than our youngest son-in-law. So there's some generational um, differences there. Um, so sometimes it feels like we're just bumping into each other constantly in this uh, bumper car arena. But um, if we can accept the differences and set some common goals and kind of kind of decide together what our family culture can look like, then we can eventually get all those bumper cars kind of going in the same direction. Um, and we try, we just really try hard to see conflict as a growth opportunity. Like, oh, you know, you're half an hour late for Thanksgiving dinner. 
what can I learn about <laughs> from this? Um, and it's not always that easy, trust me. But you know, how can we learn and grow from each other's perspectives? How can we learn and grow um, in our communication skills? And uh, just really having that growth mindset in our families is really important. All right. Um, oh, I'm doing pretty well on time here. Okay. Last concept, uh, co-powerment. Um, and I, I'm going to be really transparent here with this uh, little section. Um, I spent too many years um, being what my kids called the puppet master. Okay. Um, and this is kind of like the Borg Queen idea, um, trying to make everything work the way I thought it should work in terms of everybody's behavior and everybody's relationships with each other. And I was a puppet master. And it didn't work. It was tangled up mess. Um, and so I finally started to think about this idea of co-powerment from my um, community development studies. Um, now the, the empowerment idea is, is great. I, I still like that word empowerment because the idea is, is that we are not doing everything for everybody but we are teaching them skills so that they can do for themselves. And that, you know, that's why I love teaching because that's a form of empowerment, right? Um, unfortunately, it, it also has a little connotation of I'm the expert and you don't know anything. And so I'm, I'm gracing you with my knowledge and wisdom. Uh, so co-powerment was a, a term that was um, coined by Dr. Forrest Inslee in a talk he gave um, at Oxford University. And his definition of it is a dynamic of mutual exchange through which both sides of a social equation are made stronger and more effective by the other. Uh, so it's a fancy way of saying we are all in this together and I can bring something and you can bring something and together we can make the community or the family a better thing. So it's, it's similar to the idea of integration. It's a, it's a part of integration, um, but it, it really is, again, making space for the people in the whatever, you know, community to be engaged and to take responsibility and to um, contribute. And I think that we would all agree that that's what we want our families to look like, right? Mom doesn't want to do everything. Well, sometimes she does want to do everything. That's the problem. Right, so we need to um, kind of change our, our way of thinking so that we aren't always doing everything because when that happens, we get into this cycle of, why do I have to do everything, right? <laughs> and then, but then it's like, but I wanna do everything because I do it right. And it's just a vicious cycle. Um, so I want to tell you the ongoing saga of the eggplant suit, um, just as kind of an example of how um, our family is um, trying to implement this idea of co-powerment. So um, as I said at the beginning, that photo is the first or the last one we have of all of us together. Uh, of course, we didn't know it was going to be the last time we were together for two years. Um, but it, because of all of what's happened and, and the um, travel bans and everything, it's really my, you know, my favorite photo at this point. 
Um, and so we thankfully are planning, hoping if all goes well, we will be together for Thanksgiving this year. And so I kind of threw out this idea to the family. You know, I just want to make sure that we get a picture together. So just everybody remember <laughs> at some point when we're together, we need to get a picture together. And I just kind of threw that idea out. And um, before I knew it, it had, the kids had taken it and had just turned it into this um, just wonderful project that everyone was going to be working on together. So I have one daughter who freelances as an interior designer. And so she said, oh, well, I'll come up with a color palette, because that's kind of the first step in interior design. And so um, then I have a, a, a daughter who works in social media um, marketing. And so she's like, oh, well, I know these people that are photographers, you know, that do really good photo shoots. So I'll see if I can set up a photo shoot. And, and before I knew it, you know, I, everybody was just, you know, oh, well, I'll do this and I'll do that. And, oh, we could do it over here. And, you know, I'll, I'll scope out some locations and, and, I'm just sitting back like, wow, this is really cool. The kids are just doing this. And um, I said, well, I'll pay for the photographer. That was my contribu contribution. Well, then one of the guys decided to throw in his um, eggplant suit. This is what he wants to wear. Okay. So it, it it didn't necessarily go over with everybody the way he was hoping. There were some mixed reactions on whether or not that was really what they were looking for. Um, and so then there was all this follow up, you know, like discussion of, well, you know, I, that's a horrible suit, please don't wear that. And then, you know, but it matches, it goes with the color palette and, and um, you know, potential for some hurt feelings and conflict and those bumper cars going around, right? Um, but I just, again, you know, wanting to help my children learn to co-power in this project. Um, I avoided the temptation to puppet master, and I just let them continue to work it out. So, um, it, it, as I said, it's an ongoing saga. So, um, come back next year, maybe I'll have a chance to show you what the picture looks like when we get it all done. Um, so, there's more to that story, but that's, an, that's enough. You, you get the point. Um, so the idea again is that in our community or in our family, we are all at our best when every member finds a welcoming and adaptive environment uh, where they can access resources, participate in decision-making, uh, and work with others toward a shared goal. So the saga of the eggplant suit is, is just, you know, may seem like a really silly little example, but I know that if all goes well, that picture, when it's finally taken, is going to represent to me that our family has... Um, you know, moved one step closer to this fulfillment of this vision of really being a co-powered community. Um, so as I kind of finished up, um, you know, thinking through what I wanted to say today, I thought, you know, my title really wasn't accurate because I started out with why adult children still need their parents but I think a better title would be why adult children still need their parents and we need them. 
So um, thanks for coming. And it's only 1240. So I would love to engage in an actual conversation. And um, if you have any questions or stories of your own or. Um... Well, I have the mic, so I get to go first. Oh, OK. Power play. OK, firstly, I want to say um, check your masks, everybody. Cover the nose. And also, if you are coming in from Zoom, feel free to post a question in the chat, and we will pick that up as well. Uh, when you were describing yourself as the puppet master, um, I was Nemo's dad. That was what I got accused of being all the time was the, the, are you safe? Are you safe? Are you safe? Don't take any risks. And so that was my way of taking care of things and not necessarily for the benefit of the kids. And so now that one is in college and one is nearing college, I'm having to come to terms with a lot of that. And so this idea of co-powerment really, really struck a chord with me. So I wanted to just, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you oh, yeah, for yeah. that. And now I will go around and see if people have some questions. So I had one, okay, Sean. Yeah, one of the greatest things you can ever do is you got to be able to let the kids, you know, monitor what they're doing, but they've got to be able to go out there and take at risk. And it's really a symbolic, uh, not symbolic, but a, symbiosis relationship uh -huh. you really have to have uh -huh. with your kids now uh going back to what your daughter did now that happened to me two times when i was in germany where i was dating someone and i got to meet the family for the first time and we sit at the uh dinner table now that used to be like a custom in the united states a long time ago and that's been lost since but uh so you were the mannequin in the in that scenario. And i think what <laughs> happened your daughter applied it to that's their situation to see, you know, maybe it will work for me. Maybe we could try it with my boyfriend here. But yeah, I, I really, I thought about that. So, um, and yeah, the other thing was, uh, it's great that, just, that you share life skills, but that it's a learned experience shared together. And you can then help them when they make a mistake, but also when they make the mistake that they'll learn in that process and forever will remember, so. Yeah, yeah. Good insights for someone who doesn't have their own children, but raised, raised soldiers. So thank you, Sean, for sharing. Any other questions or insights or? Go ahead, Joanne. We have these little kids looking up at us and we know everything, you know, I, we get an over uh, inflated sense of our own importance. But when my children grew up and went away, and I had a daughter in Seattle, who called me in a panic one night. And she said, Mom, I'm being stalked. Like, what am I supposed to do about that? And I said, darn, I'm glad you took that self defense class. And I heard her stand up a little straighter and say, I did, didn't I? <laughs> so to me, there's no such thing as a mistake. You just learned what didn't work and you learn from it and you grow from it. So I figure they're going to make their own decisions. Sometimes they just need to talk and then they figure it out just by talking. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like I have to know everything anymore <laughs> and I don't have to fix everything anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where the dad hugs come in. Just, just give them a dad hug and you're good. I remember when my son um, first went away to college and we'd had quite a contentious high school period with him. And I was just so glad he was away from home. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I don't mean that in a really negative way, but he just needed to have his own, his own space. And I don't know, he'd probably been there about a I don't know, maybe a month and a half or so. And he called and he said, mom, I really value your ideas about this. And I thought I was gonna faint. I mean, I really, I, it was just so shocking that he had that idea about me because I had no inkling that he would value my ideas about whatever it was. And then later on, it wasn't really too long ago, um, uh, 
he he's had two children. He's married. He's far away. I'm not. I I, I love his new wife. I love the babies, and um, something was going on, and I don't even remember what the thing is. But he called and wanted to talk, and and he said, when I started to say something, he said, "Mom, I just want you to listen. I don't want you to fix it." And it was so cool to have him that sure of what his ideas uh, of what his needs were and that I could honor it because I really am the master puppet master I mean I really I've really got that one down and I love that metaphor and I'm going to hold that forever uh, thank you yeah it's a, it's really a challenging role because Again, it's it's like community development where we 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 do have tremendous resources in the global north that the global south, you know, what was used to be called the third world, you know, we want to share as parents, we want to share our you know learned experiences that we've learned things the hard way, right? It's it's um, it's really a, a tricky kind of situation of how do we help without hurting? And there's actually a really good book by that title, um, help, Helping Without Hurting, which is related to international development. But um, yeah, it's like, how do we uh, share what, what we know and what we have? in a in a way that's wise and it accomplishes what we hope it was going to accomplish so that's a really interesting connection that you were talking about there because it just sort of jogged some memories on some readings i've done about things like um you know short-term mission trips and things like that and it kind of goes back to the idea of tom's what they got right and what they didn't uh -huh. um going in and fixing all the problems as opposed to saying, how can I help you to fix your problems? Right. Um, or, you know, how can I make it easier for you to fix your problems? Um, recognizing that I don't know exactly what you need until I talk to you. <laughs> and that's something that's sometimes missing from things like international development okay. aid or mission trips or things like that. Or parenting. And, or parenting, <laughs> certainly. And, and so this connection that you made that's really kind of blowing my mind a little bit right now is, how much we can look at sort of international development and community development as similar to the ways in which family dynamics play out. Yeah. And I got to sit on that and think for a while, because that's a, that's a big idea. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Does anybody else have a, a question or comment they'd like to provide? Yes. I have four children. And uh, I'm going to speak to the experience I am currently having with two of them. Um, they don't speak to each other and haven't for quite some time. I'm the medium in the middle person. And so I spend time with one. I spend time with the other. I try to throw out a few. Oh, by the way, your sisters. And um, it kind of goes flat line pretty much. <laughs> Uh, but finally, this morning, even I said to one of the girls, you know, I hope you will come to terms with your experience with your sister before I die. Mm. And she said, well, the way my mind is working right now, I wish it would have been different when the final incident, so to speak, occurred. But she said, I don't see any changes in the future, immediate future like that. So I haven't found the correct vocabulary. I thought I, the final hour might be, yoo let's do this. But they're not there yet. And it's been several years. Mm -hmm. So would you have any suggestions for a phraseology that might give it a jump start? Well, again, you know, my heart goes out to um, those, to you and to those siblings and, you know, parents and children that are estranged 
Um, it's, it's not uncommon. It's very common. There's usually, you know, something in every family. Um, that, that kind of goes into that realm of um, the deeper family needs that a, a therapist or somebody with more experience and training than I have can, can offer. Uh, I do know that at one point, our family did some family therapy and we learned about the dangers of triangulation is what is happening where you, you are the you know, connecting point. And, um, and so for me personally, what I learned from that uh, season of our family life was, um, yeah, just reminding myself not to triangulate, not to put myself in that intermediary position and to just um, encourage them to talk to each other, which just sounds like what you've done. So um, yeah, that, that kind of leads into some of those really harder, deeper dy family dynamics that uh, I wish I could help more, but yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, if you have access to a counselor, sometimes, you know, even just one session gives you that language that you need or helps you understand it. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to Allison for providing her, uh, her wisdom, her knowledge, her background and everything that sort of helps us think through a lot of these big issues. So I'm thank you and come back again next week. Yeah, I'm gonna roll my credits here. <laughs>